morning and welcome to everyone, especially those who are joining us for the very first time. Um, it is an absolute joy and, and privilege having you here, having you fellowship with us this morning, or even if you're watching this on YouTube. My name is Lesejo, and I have the privilege of serving the body of Christ through Fellowship City. Um, so what is, who's Fellowship City? Um, it's a great question you ask. Fellowship City is a gospel-centered, disciple-making, and transcultural church in the heart of Centurion. We want to see the world awakened to the wonder of God and his transcultural church. And we are part of the Fellowship Church movement. So let's double-click these three words, gospel-centered, disciple-making, and transcultural. Gospel-centered means a life centered and saturated around the truth of the perfect birth, life, death, resurrection, ascension, and return of Jesus, Jesus Christ, and affirming him as Lord and Savior. So we find salvation, we find meaning, we find purpose, and we find everlasting life in Jesus Christ alone. Disciple making means that as the gospel transforms the individual life of a person, we want to see a multiplying effect of that in the lives of others. And we believe that this happens best in the making of disciples. So we are sent to share his love and make disciples who make disciples. Transcultural means having a view of community that reflects, embraces, and enjoys the diversity of its context. And by the power of the gospel, transcends it to form one new community in Christ. So what does that practically look like? So it looks like us being a family consisting of missional communities of people who are committed to living life on life, life in community, and life on mission. Life on mission being key because life on mission in, enables us to remain outwardly focused to share the good news with people and invite them into the community. And as we live life together, we use the many different gifts that God has laid in Fellowship City. And we see many of these gifts in action every time we, we tune in on a Sunday morning and today is no different. So this is what our time will look like this morning. Because we're a praying church, we're gonna spend some time praying um, immediately after I've finished with the welcome. Sanaba will be praying over our nation. We have seen and experienced so much despair, so much pain, so much suffering so much violence over the last few weeks in different areas of the country, specifically even in the KZN area. And our heart pours out to the people who are affected, the people who are feeling lonely, the people who are feeling fear and anxiety, and those who, who I need um, and don't have, and, and our heart cries out to them. So whenever we hear about despair, our heart bleeds. So Sanaba will be praying in light of what has been happening over the last few days and, and weeks over our nation. Meryl will then uh, take it from there, leading us in worship this morning. Reina will be sharing, just after Meryl's done with worship, Reina will be sharing with us some practical ways in which we can respond to the unrest and the needs that are coming through from people who are most affected during this time. So Reina will be sharing that with us. After Reino shares a response on how we can respond to what's happening in our nation, then Snaba will be reading our teaching text Reno will come back to preach about empathy. And I pray that we would hear him this morning and be encouraged and edified and spurred on to be salt and light where God has placed us. Then I will be returning after the back pass from Reno to lead us through the breakouts and feedback after the sermon reflection. And then Meryl will lead us in a final song followed by Sinaba who will send us out with a benediction. Lastly, we are to be found on the internet. So you can find this series or any other series on YouTube and all past sermons on YouTube. So please like and subscribe so you can get all content hot as it lands. Uh, please feel free to contact us. You will see the contact details on the screen. So now I'll hand over to Sanaba who will be praying for us and, and praying for our nation. Church, let us pray. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. When the earth was formless and empty, you created everything in it. You made it so beautiful. You also made us in your image and likeness. 
Father, this morning we come to you, we come to you just as we are. We are weary, we are weary because the, first few, the past few days have been really, really tough for us as a country of South Africa. As if being in the middle of COVID-19 crisis wasn't enough, we experienced unrest, violence, riots, looting, us, and driven by, among others, political anger and frustration. As a result, people have lost their lives. We, we are left heartbroken, we are left anxious. We are left with consequences that continue to hurt our economy. We are left with food shortages in KZN and part of Gauteng. We are also left with the probability of increased um, COVID-19 infections. Father, weary as we are, this morning we lift our eyes to you because our help comes from you, the creator of the universe, the creator of the heavens and the earth. Lord Jesus, you said, come to me all who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. Uh, so this morning we pray for rest, Lord. In the midst of everything, we pray for rest in you, Jesus, because you are our rest. God of all creation, we pray that you hear, you heal our land, Lord. Um, on behalf of the nation, we humble ourselves in prayer this morning. We seek your face and we turn from our wicked ways. We pray that you hear us from heaven. We pray that you forgive our sin and heal our land. Lord of hosts, we, we lift our leaders to you. We pray for the president. Uh, we pray for the ministers and all those that are in authority. We pray that you give, you give them wisdom to deal with the unrest that shake the country. We pray for them so that we may live a peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. Father, we also pray for the health workers. We pray that you give them strength as they deal with the devastating COVID-19 third wave. Jehovah Rapha, we pray that you heal the earth of the coronavirus, the earth you designed when it was formless and empty. Heal us, your people, the people that you have created in your image and likeness. In the exalted name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
Thank you so much, Meryl, for really, really awesome, spirit-filled, compassionate, encouraging worship. Likewise for Sanaba, thank you so much, Sanaba. Uh, your prayer literally moved me. I've got a used tissue as evidence uh, that I was filled with compassion as you were praying and interceding for our people. So thank you so much. And Lesekho, thank you so much for welcoming us this morning, mate. I do feel really welcome. My name is Reino. For those of you who might not know me, and uh, I have the privilege of preaching the word this morning. Before I do that, I just want to latch onto what Lesekho said, what Sanaba prayed for, and also what we just sang about. And that is, what uh, would be an appropriate response for us uh, with regard to the unrest and people experiencing food shortages and finding themselves in need. I know that as believers, as Christian people, uh, as disciples, as generous people, we want to give and we want to help. So there's two things that I just want to put to you this morning. This isn't an exhaustive list, but I think it is two ways in which we can respond that we know will and can make a difference. The first thing is, if you are on social media, there's really a lot of positive things happening on social media. I know that there's also negative things, that goes without saying, but there are a lot of positive things happening at the moment. Somebody, our communications champion, showed me this uh, during the week, right? So this is a group that was started on Facebook. It's called Rebuild SA. And this screenshot was taken this morning. And you'll see that they already have 55,000 members. I think uh, the person called Mbali Nrobu is the, uh, um, the administrator of the group or of the page. But this is a way in which people are currently responding, saying, I want to help. I have some do not have and i would like to give to those who do not have and i want to encourage you to share this i want to encourage you to read this i want to encourage you to look for things on social media that has got this same narrative a narrative of saying we might feel struck down but we are going to uh, pull together we are a nation we are the rainbow nation we are a people who are resilient we are going to rise from the so-called ashes. Well, it's not so-called ashes, really. It's literal ashes in this sense. So this is a screenshot. Uh, I don't have a Facebook profile, so I couldn't actually log in and participate in the conversation. But I do want to show you, if you are on the socials, I think this is worth looking at. And then you'll see that Mbali and Lobu, um, wrote a, a couple of steps and the ways that the group is working and there's google forms to fill out which you guys by now well at least everyone part of fellowship city should know quite well how to fill out a google form so i think on the one side guys let's speak hope uh, let's um <clears throat> let's speak about um, um getting involved let's speak about helping each other out Let's speak about ways in which we can make a tangible difference. So this is the one thing that I want to show you. And then on the other side, it might be that you have money that you would like to give away, right? We are a generous people and giving money away is a part of us showing the gospel to other people. The question just is at the moment, where can I give money that it will reach ground level, grassroots level, in the places that find themselves in the most need at this point. Now, this is a, a missions organization or a training organization called Focus Team Leadership Training. I've been in a relationship with this organization since 2006. We've come a long way during my theological studies. I also received training at this organization. And two of the directors of this organization actually live in KZN in some of the worst hit or most affected areas. And as a church, Fellowship City, we are going to support them with money, which is phase one of helping them now in their most dire need. Phase two of this project of FTLT helping the most hit places not only in KwaZulu-Natal, but also in Gauteng, and maybe even as close as Mamalodi, would be to actually um, um, uh, get together um, uh, material goods, right, uh, that people might need in this time. And then phase three would be creating task teams to go and do some rebuilding projects. If you feel like you want to take part in this, I want to encourage you uh, to give your money towards this organization. 
we are going to give some money as a church towards this organization. And if you want to add to that, you are welcome to do it. If you are already giving generously to our church, I do want to thank you for doing that. You can use the same um, uh, bank details as always just use the reference ftlt ftlt and then when we pay over the money from the church to their fund we'll be sure to add your money to that as well if you've never given money to our church and you don't have any bank details but you would like to give to this organization specifically doing work in those most hit, most hit areas at this point, please send Lesejo a message in the chat and he'll send you the bank details that you need to use with the reference FTLT. I wanna encourage you guys uh, to get involved. There are tangible ways in which we can do it. And I'm really excited to see the witness of the church getting involved in a time like this. Awesome. Let me uh, skip to this i would like to hand the mic back to our sister snubba to read the teaching text for us and then we will start with our sermon um church our teaching text for this morning comes from mark chapter 1 verse 35 to 45. very early in the morning while it was still dark he he got up went out and made his way to a deserted place and there he was praying Simon and his companions searched for him, and when they, when they found him, they said, everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, let's go on to the neighboring villages so that I may preach there too. This is why I have come. He went into all of Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Then a man with leprosy came to him and on his knees, begged him, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Moved with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched him. I am willing, he told him, be made clean. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. Then he sternly warned him and sent him away at once, telling him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go and show yourself to the priest and offer what Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Yet he went out and began to proclaim it widely and to spread the news with the result that Jesus could no longer enter a town properly, but he was out in deserted places and they came, for, they came to, to him from everywhere. That is the word of the Lord. Thanks so much, Sonaba, uh, for reading the teaching text to us. I unfortunately skipped a slide. You weren't supposed to see that, but uh, I'll show that to you now. Guys, my hope this morning is that we would be encouraged, that we would be edified, that we would be activated to respond with empathy in a time like this, and that we would be inspired. My hope for this morning is that we would see Jesus, and by seeing Jesus and beholding him, that we would have our minds blown and that we would say yes to being exactly like him. Today is a loaded moment, right? So Nava uh, embodied something of that when she prayed. I don't know if you know it, but today is actually called Mandela Day, right? It was first declared Mandela Day by the United Nations in 2009 and it's been celebrated since 2010. It is a day in which people say there's someone that we want to honor who made a difference in the history of our country for 67 years. He struggled for the liberation and freedom of the country's people. And therefore, we also want to um, uh, honor him in doing something for someone today for 67 minutes. It was a whole vibe in the beginning of the 2010s. I'm not on social media at the moment, so I'm not quite sure how big the Mandela Day vibe is today, but it is a day in which our focus turns to marginalized people in need, helping them, interceding for them, and doing something meaningful for someone else. It's also a loaded moment because we live in this time of unrest that we just spoke about, prayed for, and uh, choose to share a couple of responses with you. We are still in a global pandemic that's been said today. We live in a time where it seems like Right? There's a lot of uh, political anger, Sunaba called it, 
Uh, my prayer for our politicians is always, will you please remember that you were voted into that position to serve the people. You were not voted into that position for power or for money, but to actually lay yourself down and to pour yourself out. We live in this really intense time at this moment. And I do believe that today is a really, really timely word for us, because I think today's scripture reading gives us an appropriate and a biblical response for a time like this. And I think this response, guys, well, no, not I think, I believe that this response is achievable for us, not out of our own power, but exactly by the Holy Spirit living in us. So like I just said, I really do hope that we will be edified and encouraged today. The whole reason for us doing this series is that we want to see a city changed. We spoke about that in the first two sermons. God sent us to a specific place with really good news. And the question is, if this city becomes like the church, if our city would become a fellowship city, what would it look like? We want to see people changed individuals we want to see relationships changed and healed we want to see people come to faith in jesus christ we want to see the transformation that the bible promises and even in this time we want explanation for what's happening and we want to see transformation that's what the gospel does the gospel tells us what is wrong with the world and the gospel tells us how the world ought to change and therefore i do believe that today's message is definitely an achievable a goal for us and a really good response to see our city become a fellowship city. I do want to say that today we'll talk about empathy and probably next week as Murundini will preach about nurturing people first. I think this will actually become like a mini series in the bigger series. Okay, so the Gospel of Mark. So now I just read from it. We are at the end of chapter one in the Gospel of Mark. So the chapter one of the Gospel of Mark sets up the story, right? Think about it as a movie trailer. A movie trailer is supposed to tell you that there's characters, there's conflict, there's a desired outcome, it's going to be turning points, there's going to be people for and people against, and then there's going to be this dramatic end. It doesn't show you everything, but it does show you enough to understand who is who and what is going on there. So Mark already did that in chapter one. Then we see just after he sets the scene, he uh, tells about Jesus immediately and urgently calling people into his ministry, okay? calling people into this mission that he says he is here for. And right after that, we see Jesus getting to work. We see Jesus working really long days. We see Jesus producing massive, massive results um, as he's working and as he's ministering. We see this fight that gets set up in chapter one, we see this starting to take place. These two kingdoms clashing, this message of repentance and faith that people will either accept, that they will doubt, or that they will reject. It's a phenomenal, phenomenal book, and it starts with quite some speed. Let me just show you this picture that I accidentally showed to you uh, prematurely. This is, I think, Kind of what the Gospel of, Mark's, uh, of Mark feels like in the beginning. It starts quite quick, flashes by quite quickly. So I just want to show you a couple of images to, just to ground us in the story. Because the portion of scripture that's in Abare today is a very rich portion of scripture. And it might actually pass us by, I think, too quickly. Let me show you where all of this happened. Right. So this is the Sea of Galilee also called in some Gospels the Sea of Tiberias, or the, uh, the Galilean Sea, if you want to. That's Marie, my wife, uh, standing on the edge of the Sea of Galilee. And then in the distance, you see the Golan Heights, which is the border between Israel, Jordan, and Syria. Now, this is quite a rocky edge of the Sea of Galilee. It doesn't look like this everywhere. We just happen to be at a place that is filled with rocks. But there are obviously parts of the sides of the Sea of Galilee that are nice and beachy or nice and sandy. This is a picture of an excavated Capernaum. Okay? So that's the village where Jesus lived during the three years of his public ministry. So small houses built with stone, 
on the edge of the Sea of Galilee. If you look there in the photo, you'll see the water mass there. So it's right, right, right on the edge of the Sea of Galilee. If you would walk in this direction, which is the southern direction, through this little excavated town, you would reach the beach, which is the side of the Sea of Galilee. This is a synagogue that was built in Capernaum later than the time that Jesus actually lived. And you'll see if you uh, kind of glance into the distance, the whole town was probably as big as two football fields and would probably have between 150 and 450 people if we would count them in a census. Now, I know that is a massive bracket, but because people walked in the first century and because hospitality was such a big value, it was actually quite difficult to determine like who stayed here because people would often sleep over at family or friends or they would be together and then the sun would set and they would go, ah, dude, I might just as well stay over. So that's why we draw such a big bracket when we look at the first century towns. But this is where it all took place. Everything we just read. Now, what we're going to do today is we're just going to look at one verse in this portion of scripture, and we are going to focus our attention on that verse, because that verse explains Jesus's response, and Jesus's response is something that we should nurture, and that is a response of empathy. So, spoiler alert, that's where we are going to land. That's what I want you to have in focus when you look at this photo that's currently up on the screen. Jesus experiences empathy, he shows empathy, and therefore we ought to nurture, nurture empathy as a church. Just going to stop sharing for now, and then I'll get back to the slide. So we see in verse 41, we see that it says, Jesus moved with compassion, he reached out. Now the verses prior to verse 41 is also very, very important. Okay. Firstly, we see that Jesus spends time with the Father. Did you guys see in verse 35, early in the morning, he went out to be by himself. It's like charging your cell phone. Cable in, let's get to 100% before we start this day. All of us know who has mobile phones. The joy of starting the day with a filled battery and also the dread of starting the day with either a yellow low powered mode or even a red battery is almost empty um, um, uh, caution or, or notification. We see that Jesus is gaining followers prior to verse 41. Why? Well, because he's Jesus, right? He shows grace week one in our series. He is obviously Christ, right? So the Christ likeness that we spoke about last week is evident in Jesus' life. He um, embodies it. Mark even uses a word like everyone is looking for you in verse 37, right? So Jesus is gaining a lot of followers. We saw Jesus clearly stating his mission, which is very important. Like he knows exactly what he's supposed to do. He said that in verse 38, this is why I have come, right? Not mocking about, focused, getting to the job, doing what I'm supposed to do. And in all of this, right, so the small town and the uh, surrounding villages and the Sea of Galilee, as quick as it's going with this singular focus on what his mission is, he has this interaction. Now what happens between Jesus and the man with leprosy is very important for us. And I would like to tell you why. Well, firstly, we rebel or love the fact that we don't necessarily have to listen to people like we always do, or we even love the fact that I could listen to you at a faster speed than you are actually speaking. Think about WhatsApp voice notes, guys. I don't know how many of you have updated your WhatsApp recently, but our beloved uh, instant messaging platform WhatsApp now has the function in which you can send me a voice note and I can forward you and listen to you at either one and a half speed or even twice as fast as you are actually speaking. Isn't that just comfortable and absolutely magnificent? I don't have to spend the time that you want me to spend um, uh, uh, on you. I can actually forward you and I can listen to you a little bit quicker than I want uh, or, or than you spoke to me, right? We have difficulty listening. We have difficulty pausing. We have difficulty stopping because the world is moving so fast. 
So later in the breakout rooms, you guys will discuss WhatsApp voice notes. And I do just want to give you a warning. This is not a debate session. So hashtag love, hashtag Christian church, right? Hashtag meaningful and edifying conversations, right? So don't get into a debate, but I am going to ask you a question about WhatsApp voice notes. Secondly, let me invite you into my shoes, literally into my shoes. So this is a pair of shoes of mine. It's a freedom of movement felt schoon, or in short, it can be called the felly. Color is stone. Thank you so much to my two good mates, Clulo Modiba, Francho de Vet, and even my own wife, Marie, who said, I think you will look nice in a pair of fellies, right? So I've got a pair of these, really comfy. They are. I also do have a pair of these. This is called uh, the Nike Free Run, right? As soft as marshmallows. Look at these soles, really, really, really comfortable. Uh, used to be one of my pairs of running shoes in one of the comrades' races that I completed. I also do have the, a pair of Toms, much like a slipper. Okay, these were bought in 2009. The color is called olive and lime. The style is called the stitched vegan. I know that you're looking at these and wondering how on earth can Reina be wearing those for 12 years, but I actually have, I actually have. So these are some of the pairs of shoes that I have in my closet. Now, which one of these pairs do you think are the most comfortable? I don't know if it is, is or are, but let's go for are. Now, which one is? Which one is more comfortable? What would you say? If you are a chat machine on Zoom, hit me with a chat real quick, just in the chat box. Fally, running shoe, or slipper? Let's have a few responses. Looking at the chat, staring intently. We've got a slipper going here. Thank you so much, Sanmarie. Uh, we've got running shoe from the Nefales. We've got running shoes from Sarah. We've got running shoes from Kone. Whoa, Tom's all the way from my own wife. Running shoes, slipper. Guys, the chat's lighting up. Thank you so much. The Fally. Thank you so much uh, from the Lehongs. Uh, the running shoes after 50 kilometers, the Nikes. Absolutely loving this. This has the potential to derail my sermon. So I'm just going to pause there uh, from Tienz's reply. Now, how did you decide which one of my shoes might be the most comfortable? Well, you worked from your perspective, right? So you assumed wearing your slippers is comfy, so mine should be. Or wearing your running shoes is comfortable, so mine should be. Or wearing your phallus is comfortable, so mine should also be. And that's fine for the purposes of the question that I asked you, right? Because I asked you to respond. But if you think about this in a deeper way, we often don't really put ourselves in someone else's shoes. We just assume why they do what they do and do what they say and feel what they feel because we might relate to it. Okay, so I have a reason why this is my most comfortable shoe, the freedom of movement felly, but I'm not going to do a sales pitch now. Point is, by using this illustration, that if we want to get into someone else's shoes, we are going to have to park some of our assumptions, and we are going to have to listen deeply. And because we uh, find it so difficult to listen deeply, we often find it really difficult to show proper job empathy. Okay, so back to our portion of scripture. Uh, thank you also so much for everyone taking part in the chat. That was kind of fun, I have to say. So just look at this portion of scripture that I marked in red. Jesus stops, right? This man with leprosy came to him. He was on his knees and he was begging him. Jesus stopped. He didn't pass by. He listened because there's a request coming from this person. And that request is, will you please make me clean? I am begging you to help me. And then we see this beautiful reaction. Jesus is moved with compassion. And then we see Jesus reaching out and not doing what he thinks is best, doing what the person asked him for. Right? So listening deeply understanding the need and then say saying i am willing to do for you what you asked me to do be made clean isn't that just phenomenal right it's really only two sentences three if you want to four i see in this translation but it's so 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 powerful so let's park for a minute 
at this word moved with compassion. The Greek word for moved with compassion or for compassion is splagnitsumai, right? It's quite a tongue twister now, isn't it? It describes the same experience we have when we have empathy towards someone uh, or when we feel empathy for someone, right? It means, if you would look it up in a dictionary, to be moved as to one's bowels, right? To feel your stomach and your intestines turning. Now, in the New Testament, or in the time that the New Testament was written, your stomach were thought to be the seat of love and pity, right? When you really feel deeply, you feel in your stomach. We even have that today in English. I would say, when I saw that, I felt sick to my stomach. That is exactly what Jesus felt when he saw this person. From the uh, medical or human sciences perspective, let me just make a few remarks on sympathy and on empathy. So what's the difference between empathy and sympathy? Let's just get a, a grip on what's going on here. Well, basically it is emotion. So empathy means experiencing someone else's feelings, experiencing them. Sympathy, on the other hand, means understanding someone else's suffering, right? Understanding it up here. It's a cognitive understanding, but it does keep a certain distance between you and the other person. Like, I know what you mean, instead of, I feel you. So empathy is to feel what someone else feels and then to enter that experience. The ability to see the world through someone else's pain. Now Jesus, our Messiah, our leader, our King, and the one who we center our lives around, he's the perfect embodiment of this, of showing empathy and experiencing empathy and viewing the world through the pain of others. Let me just show you this case in point. These are all the other places, apart from Mark 1, where this word is used in the Gospels, right? So three more times in Mark, you'll see them. Look at all those scripture references in Matthew. Look at all, uh, all three scripture references in Luke. And I marked one in red because that is where we find the parable of the Good Samaritan, right? So then Splaknitsumai is not used as a reaction of Jesus, but in a parable that Jesus tells, he says, this person who, at the end of the story, you see, did the right thing, was moved with compassion, right? He felt his stomach turn when he saw the person that was robbed and lying in the middle of the road. And there's all the ways that it gets described. Twice as feel compassion, seven times as felt compassion, twice as moved with compassion, and once as take pity. It's just translated in the English translations like this. Now, back to the medical sciences, we see, um, we see that there are really three parts to empathy, right? And then I'll, uh, I'll, I'll be done with the human sciences part. Is there's the thinking part, right? Imagining myself in that situation and what it would be like. There's the emotive part, right? Standing shoulder to shoulder with a other person and, and trying to feel with them. It's not above them. It's not apart from them, but it's together with them, right? You see the connection. And then there's also empathic action, right? Responding and doing something in this situation. Now, just get that word, empathic. So you have emphatic, you have empathetic, and then you have empathic. It's quite a tongue twister. That's a nice quiz for you for Sunday lunch. What's the difference between those three? I'm just joking. I'm just joking. So uh, before we go into a empathic response, the feeling part and the thinking part is really important, right? There's a common saying that goes, don't just stand there, do something. If we really want to feel empathy and we want to show it the way that Jesus showed it, we might actually say, right, and it will sound goofy, don't just do something, stand there, right? Go through the thinking and the listening process first. Go through the feeling and shoulder to shoulder process first, because then you will reach a place where you can say, I'm willing. I understand. I see the world through your lens and I can actually offer you something that will be helpful and meaningful and might alleviate your pain. Brene Brown, she's a really um, well-known psychologist. I think 
you can call her a social psychologist, well-known speaker, author, lots of TED talks she's done. She says, really can a response make something better? What makes something better is connection. Really can a response make something better? What makes something better is connection. And do you guys see that in the story of Jesus, and even in the kind of the three phases of empathy I just described, there's a connection before the action. There's something happening in relationship. There's something deeply human happening between Jesus and this other human being. Well, let's think about this. Let's think about the week that passed. Think about all the interactions you had with people this week. Let's start small in your own family, your own spouse, your own kids. Let's think a little bit bigger, your church family, right? The people on screen we have here now. Let's think a little bit bigger, your colleagues. Let's think a little bit bigger. Somewhere you probably receive public services of some sort, someone behind a cashier or someone filling up your car with fuel or something like that. How did you show empathy in those spaces? Or where did you see the need to embody empathy and to nurture empathy in those connections? Could you do it? Did you know when to do it? Did you do it? What was the outcome, right? So let's think people, let's think relationships. Think of all the people you just saw this week and you didn't necessarily have interactions with. How many people did you pass by in traffic, right? I know you have to keep your eyes on the road, given. But how many people did you see in traffic? What did they experience? What did you see them doing? What did their faces tell you as you looked at them? Maybe people just walking past you, not necessarily driving past you. Did you notice them? And what did you notice if you did? Think of all the people you thought about this week, right? People that made it into your minds, people that made it into your hearts that you didn't necessarily see physically. Think about all the news you read. Think about all the television you watched this week. Think about seeing people looting shops. Think about seeing shop owners that were the victims of looting. Think about police officers you saw. Think about community policing forums, leaders you saw speaking about their communities, wanting to make a difference, responding to this crazy time we are in. Think about a teenager that you saw being sent to go and loot, really desperate. Think about mothers that had to, they say, do it because of desperation. Think of siblings losing one another in this chaos that we saw over the telly. What would it look like for us to have Christ-like empathy in all these situations for all these people? Stopping and allowing the Spirit to move us with compassion from the small, the people that you could literally reach out to now, to the big, the people you've never met, but people that you saw coming into your heart and into your mind this week. What would it look like if we responded like Jesus? What would it look like if we stopped and we listened and we were moved all the way to our stomachs and then we took action or we responded? We made a connection with the human being first before we decided to do anything. And I intentionally described the groups of people like I did now because they're all human beings, all created in the image of God all able to make a connection with us, all in need of something. How do we respond in these situations? Now, I think there are a few common mistakes we can make when we want to show empathy towards someone. I'm not necessarily going to double click that now because I am conscious of our time. But I do want to encourage you in the breakouts when we speak about showing empathy, uh, if a thought comes to mind about a common mistake we often make when we show empathy to someone, please share it with us. Uh, you would have seen on our socials on a Wednesday, we put a quote and a photo of someone who said something in the breakouts. So something you might say today might make it to our social account. Hashtag shameless, shameless plug, just putting that out there. What I want you to see, and we'll land the plane here, is when Jesus is moved with compassion and he responds in the way he did, 
it says at the end of our scripture reading, he could no longer enter a town openly. That is how much traction he got in his ministry, just by doing this. Well, obviously, and proclaiming the word and healing people and describing the kingdom, sure. But this character that Jesus, sh that Jesus showed, this thing that Jesus did with another human being, really, really ramped up his ministry. Guys, can you imagine if people would stream to our church in this part of the city because we are a people who nurture empathy? Can you imagine if showing empathy to someone that we interact with, with someone in this area, changes their life in the way that this man who was a leper I had his life changed? Can you just imagine the effect of showing empathy in a time of struggle and of division and of anger and of restlessness and of breaking down someone else's stuff? Can you imagine what effect empathy would have in relationships, on people and on our society? Let me land the plane by asking a question. Have you ever experienced Jesus having compassion for you? Because that's really the experience that we draw from when we show compassion to someone else. Think about it. You and I, this morning, in this service, who call ourselves Christians, who believe in Jesus Christ, we were the man with leprosy, begging on our knees to be saved. We became aware of our sin. We were convicted of our sin. We knew that we couldn't pay for it. We knew that we couldn't atone for it. We knew that we had nothing to offer. We knew that we needed grace and love and acceptance. And then we said, please, please, on our, on our knees, begging Jesus for mercy. And he gave it to us. He looked at us with empathy. And he said to each and one, every one of us, I am willing. I'm willing to forgive you, Reino. I'm willing to forgive you, blank, fill in the blank yourself. And it's from that experience that we show empathy to other people. How sweet was that feeling of salvation? How sweet was that feeling when you gazed upon Jesus on your knees and you got someone that stopped and that listened and that felt compassion on you and even gave his life for you so that you can be saved. And then receiving the salvation that he gave you. If we want to nurture empathy as a church, as Fellowship City, it means that we should have a heart for wounded people. It means that we should do the same thing as Jesus did to us. Do the same thing as Jesus did to you. A Fellowship City nurtures empathy. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we are thankful for this portion of Scripture. We are thankful that you showed each and every one of us empathy. We are thankful that when you were a human, you were moved with compassion. You became sick to your stomach when you saw wounded and lost people. And that spurred you on to faithfully complete the mission that you were sent to do. Please do the same work in us. Please fill us with your spirit in you. Please spur us on to do what you've called us to do. Please move us when we see wounded and broken people around us, not only far, but also near and everywhere in between. May we become a church that nurtures empathy for the sake of your glory and your kingdom coming in this place, Lord Jesus. We pray that in your name. Amen. I chose the song last week um, called The Blessing after finding a um, after finding a Af Afrikaans version of it that I'd never heard before uh, and it was it was really really beautiful to me that it was translated for us as South Africans and Afrikaans is not my home language but there's something that happens when you sing out of a place of home <laughs> and um, we sang the song last week a Sunday and then the news unfolded like it did during the week and I found myself just at such a loss 
Oh, I didn't know what to pray. I didn't know what to say. Um, some people also like messaged from outside of South Africa. Um, and even now the news is very, it's very difficult to follow like what the story is or what it isn't. Um, but what I do know is that um, that people are struggling and people are suffering. Um, yeah, so uh, I just felt that we sing the song again. Um, it's a it's a song to send us out to um, just proclaim biblical. It's it's all based on scripture, which has been the only thing that I've been able to say or do is be, is to sing scripture or sing a song. <laughs> Um, so, if you will, just sing with us, sing it as a prayer, declare it out into your neighborhood, declare it out to South Africa, to, um, to your heart, to your family.
Our family, we end all our gatherings with a benediction, meaning good word. So our benediction this morning comes from Ephesians 5, verse 1 and verse 2. Therefore, be imitators of God as dearly loved children and walk in love, as Christ also loved us and gave himself for us, a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. May you have a blessed week, family. Thank you so much, Sanaba, uh, for finishing us off. Guys, it is my privilege in this time and in this moment, after everything we've spoken, uh, to leave you with a blessing. And that is, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship, presence of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. Have a phenomenal Sunday. A great week. Amen.